scale one. And you can also see lots and lots of, of, of starlight, which has obvious distinct color right across the entire sky. If you compare that to a Bortle scale nine, which is your inner city sky, you can see that the Milky Way is certainly not visible in that circumstance. And only the very basic sort of star clusters can be seen by the most experienced observers and the brightest constellations uh, are discernible, but may have missing stars. So there's a huge scale from one to nine on the Bortle scale. So have a little look at um, actually the Milky Way from planet Earth. So this is what we would expect to see in the darkest parts of Exmoor National Park on a dark, uh, clear night. This is essentially a Bortle scale one because you've got the reflection from the water and you've got a fair amount of detail in those dust lanes of the Milky Way. And just because I'm normally um, inspiring people to look up and, and understand what they're seeing in terms of the night sky, I thought we'd just spend a couple of slides looking at actually what the Milky Way is and what we're actually looking at. So the Milky Way is the galaxy that planet Earth sits in. It's, it's where the solar system operates and essentially, it's a galaxy in space, a galaxy containing a, more than 100 billion stars. I've put up on the screen a little simulation of the Milky Way. And as you can see, uh, as I say, it's a simulation because the Milky Way is such a vast galaxy that we haven't yet worked out how to get outside the galaxy and take a selfie looking back at ourselves. So this is what scientists believe the Milky Way looks like. We think it's a, a spiral galaxy. It may even be what we call a barred spiral, which means that the uh, inner part of the actual galaxy where the bright sort of egg yolk is of our galaxy may well be sort of more elongated than circular. But essentially it's, it's probably a barred spiral um, and as I say, containing at least 100 billion stars. Uh, and in this little circle here, which I've illustrated on the screen, is where you are. That is planet Earth, the entire solar system, and every single star that you can see at night. So you can see that we actually operate in a very small part of this massive galaxy. Just to give you an idea of scale of the Milky Way, if we were to go from here to here at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second, it would take us at least 100,000 years to go across. So when you're standing in the middle of Exmoor National Park on a dark sky and you're looking up and you're viewing the Milky Way in all its glory, what you're actually looking at is you're looking towards the center, towards the center of the Milky Way. You're looking through this gas lane here uh, up on the screen. Um, and some of that gas, that gas and that dust gets in the way of the stars behind. So quite often when you look at the Milky Way, you'd see this sort of black stretch of dust, which seems to glow from behind. So essentially you're looking towards the center. And as I say, that's how we measure light pollution, uh, certainly from Exmoor and on the Bortle scale. But light pollution is not just a UK problem. Here we've got a map uh, taken from the very kind permission of the International Dark Sky Association. And you can see uh, quite clearly uh, where the problem of light pollution truly exists. Uh, you've got it all around the cities, the glow of orange around London, around Liverpool, Middlesbrough, going right up into Scotland. And then on contrast, you can see the actual areas where it's pretty dark. So if we look obviously here on Exmoor, that's where we are. Uh, we have obviously the Brecon Beacons in Mid Wales. We have Northumbria and up on the Yorkshire Dales. And then obviously up into the Highlands I, I and West, Western Isles of Scotland. I, I can't hear anyone. Oh, I'm... OK, hopefully you can hear me. I'm not sure that Keith can, so um, I will carry on. But basically, the, 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 you know, there are very uh, great demarcation between places which have very dark skies and places.
places which clearly don't. And what saddens me the most, of course, of my teaching and inspiration, particularly in schools, you will visit some places, for, for example, in London, where children are not even able to see simple constellations because of the amount of light pollution. And as I say, it's not just a UK problem, it happens all over the world. So this is a picture of Paris from space and New York, and you can certainly see the sky glow above the skies there in New York. And there are even places in the world where you think that light pollution may not be quite as much of a problem, such as Iran. But yes, even though you can see the Milky Way here, you can see that sky glow encroaching on the darkness of the night. So it's a massive problem. And that's not all. So it's not just from artif artificial light. We are having increasing light, uh, light pollution threats from outer space too. So you may have heard of this gentleman, very famous in terms of space exploration, and very uh, driven in terms of space exploration. This chap is called Elon Musk. Uh, and he's sort of um, uh, the guy behind putting a uh, potentially humans on Mars. He's developing super rocket technology. And for that, I can't, you know, I can't demean him. However, uh, he has a hand in this, something called Starlink and the Starlink constellation. The star is essentially a series of star, uh, Starlink satellites, which are, are being placed in orbit around the Earth to provide 5G internet across the world. And whilst that might seem absolutely fantastic and obviously may solve the world's internet uh, problems, particularly in areas where internet is not so great, it does and will have a potential catastrophic e effect on being able to observe the night sky. So his, his plan is to put 42,000 satellites up into space above the Earth. And if we have a look at what this would look like, uh, from Earth, and this includes Exmoor National Park as well, uh, this is, is potentially what would be seen from the ground. So it's, it, this is what we call a Starlink constellation train. And essentially what these are, are satellites that are reflecting the sun's light. So they don't have any light of their own, but the, the means of propelling these objects uh, through uh, the um, shields um, actually reflects the sunlight. And if you imagine a sky full of 42,000 of these objects, that's what it will potentially look like from space, the whole uh, sort of web, if you like, of satellites across the world. So one thing I do want you to take from my little talk this morning about light pollution and astronomical skies is actually we need to make people aware of this. It's, um, you know, from the ground, it can be seen as, as quite a cool thing to look at, but actually we need to make people aware that this is and has the potential to be quite detrimental to observing the night sky and maybe lobby councils and so forth uh, against it. So what about Exmoor? Well, Exmoor um, has, has previously been said, was one of the first uh, dark sky or Europe's first dark sky reserves. But since uh, that time in 2011, uh, more mental effects of light pollution, particularly on human health, particularly on wildlife, but also particularly on observational ast astronomy. And so various different places across uh, the country have now set up and we're getting much more recognition in terms of why it's important to ge keep your dark skies uh, really, truly dark. So let's have a little closer look at Exmoor National Park. And obviously this map is probably familiar to all of you, but um, I've recently done um, a guide, which Katrina is gonna tell, uh, tell you about and talk to you about, um, about the best types of places on Exmoor to actually observe the night sky. But I want to just sort of show you actually how uh, Exmoor is actually split up and, and where sort of to go if, if you want to do some serious one to three bottle scale stargazing. So, all the sort of purple areas here are pretty much bottle scale one to three. So some of these areas offer the best opportunities to see a truly dark starlit sky, but that's not to demean any of the other areas that are in, in gray. Um, 
nowhere on Exmoor National Park is above a, a bottle scale of four. Uh, four stroke five um, and so you know the whole park itself is is an absolute fantastic gem uh, in terms of astronomy uh, stargazing and observations of the night sky so um, you can normally see around about uh, a thousand stars at least with the naked eye on Exmoor National Park. Uh, and if we compare that to the nearest city to Exmoor, which is, is Taunton, um, yeah, you're, you're lucky if you can see 50. So, you know, even within that sort of short distance, uh, we go from having truly dark to, you know, this is probably a Bortle scale eight stroke nine. Uh, and this is the place where we'd find children who are not able to see uh, star patterns and star constellations particularly clearly. So it's a real, real shame. And it is something that obviously Exmoor are working to maintain. And, and obviously we do work really hard in order to keep the skies above Exmoor truly truly dark. Uh, what a beautiful place. So this is a fantastic picture of the Milky Way taken from, uh, you probably recognize it, but it's uh, Dunkery Beacon. And as I said to you before, you're looking towards the center of our own galaxy. Uh, here's that dust lane I was explaining about. So the darkness of that dust is literally clouding or shielding the glow of all of those 100 billion stars uh, behind it. So, you know, truly standing here, looking at that, it gives you a sort of sense of scale of the universe uh, that we live in. It's, it's immense. Um, in case you're interested in finding out more about the value of a dark sky and how it affects astronomical observations, but also research and science, uh, these are some fantastic websites that you can take a look at. Uh, I would certainly recommend this one, Commission for Dark Skies, uh, which goes on to talk about light pollution in detail, and also sort of some of the mitigations that you can use for light pollution, because it's not necessarily about using no lights, it's using the right type of lighting at the right time and for the right purpose. So there's some super tips on uh, the Commission for Dark Skies on how you can do that. Again, the International Dark Skies Association are instrumental across the world in trying to maintain dark skies for astronomical research, as is the Royal Astronomical Society and uh, the Campaign for Rural England, as they used to be called, are now the countryside charity. They also sort of um, petition and lobby uh, for keeping our skies uh, dark for all of the reasons that we've become to understand. And obviously there's the link for the Dark Sky Reserve to find out the best places to go and observe those amazing dark uh, sun, uh, starlit skies. So I'm going to leave you with a little video which um, actually explains basically what I've said, but actually with visuals. So visual images of the night sky across the world. Uh, it's a, a, a little video from a friend of mine called Mark G, who is lucky enough to live uh, in New Zealand, uh, where the skies are particularly dark. But his message in this video um, is really key for everybody. It's key for everyone across the world in actually maintaining the darkness so that we can preserve the night sky for the future generations to come. So enjoy. The sun goes down every single day in cities around the world, and as day turns to night, we illuminate our cities with artificial light. Unfortunately, much of this artificial lighting is a form of pollution. This light pollution threatens our environments, energy resources, humans and wildlife, as well as astronomical research. And with cities consistently expanding, this form of pollution is progressively affecting our lives and spreading further each year. So why do I care? Well, apart from all the negative effects, the further you move away from the cities, the less light pollution there is. And the night sky, free of light pollution, with all its incredible detail. Well, that's just something you really need to experience for yourself.
Life without dark skies, you don't know what you're missing. And thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope you've, I've inspired you to go out and look at that beautiful dark uh, night sky. Thank you. Joe, thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm glad you mentioned about the Starlink because I was looking for the um, International Space Station a few weeks back. Um, there were so many satellites in all directions. I didn't know what I was looking at. Um, they really are a problem. But anyway, yeah. thank you. That was excellent. You're very welcome. Okay, um, that leads us on conveniently to our second speaker, who is uh, Katrina Munro. And Katrina is the Economy Project Officer for the National Park Authority, uh, which supports tourism, it promotes local produce, and relevant to this, the dark skies. Over to you, Katrina. Hey, everybody. Um, yes, thank you for the introduction, Nigel. Um, yeah, I'm really pleased to speak to you about um, some of the work that the National Park Authority are doing with uh, local businesses in order to promote astrotourism. Just firstly to mention, uh, we're all really well aware of the um, amazing landscapes that we have here on Exmoor and that they're the primary reason why over two million visitors come here every year. Um, but when we think about the local economy and the importance of tourism on the economy, we really want to ma maximise the, the amount of visitors coming here every year, um, within reason, ob obviously. Um, but it's really important that we look at um, everything that the National Park has to offer. And as you've heard from Joe, um, our incredibly dark skies really add to our offer here in, in, um, in the southwest. The, um, in, in, in addition to our incredibly dark skies, the tranquility and that sense of wonder that people can experience is quite unique. Um, and also the nocturnal wildlife that people can um, in, uh, experience if they come here. So what is astrotourism? Basically, it's all about people holidaying in a rural um, destination that has beautiful landscapes. The great thing about astrotourism is a lot of it is also done out of holiday, peak holiday season. Um, because the nights get darker slightly earlier in the autumn and winter, um, and it's not quite so cold, um, the autumn and winter is a great time to attract people to come to Exmoor um, to make use of the stargazing opportunities. So that's a great asset for the National Park in terms of the local economy. Um, but also astrotourism is great in, in respect to the fact that it's really important that we um, help people better understand and really value the uniqueness of our dark skies. So if people come here and experience the wonder of them, they're more likely to appreciate the importance of dark skies um, and not having huge light pollution. I'm just going to share a couple of screens with you. So our journey in astrotourism started really back in 2011, as Joe mentioned, when Exmoor was designated as an international dark sky reserve by the International Dark Sky Association. It came at a really important time in um, sort of bringing astronomy into the spotlight. Brian Cox had just started his um, popular BBC Stargazing Live programmes and Exmoor featured within those. And since then, we've uh, very much began to um, be recognised as one of the top stargazing destinations in the UK. The, the more, vi you know, more visitors are becoming aware of it, and certainly the media are really good at helping to pass out the message. Sorry about that. There's a, yeah, we get loads of um, online material um, passed around to, you know, really wide audiences, even internationally, you'll see in the bottom middle there, something that was over in Japan. So um, Exmoor really does get its fair share of promotion for our dark skies. Um, and with astro photographs, like the ones we've got in some of those images there, which are often provided by um, keen amateur local astro photographers, they really spark the enthusiasm and inspire the public to join us. So we've had quite a lot of coverage in some of the, um, the broadsheet papers, you know, the Telegraph, the Independent, the Guardian, they've all done features about our dark skies. And that really helps put astro tourism um, and Exmoor together in everyone's mind. So how have we been developing the opportunity um, locally here? Well, we've been um, working on a lot of projects in the last few months. 
um, and years. So in the early days after we received our designation, we did quite a lot of work with uh, popular astronomer Seb Jay. At the time, he was one of the few people here who was offering dark sky experiences. Um, we asked him to not only run several events for us, but he also produced the Dark Skies uh, Handbook, which we still sell now in our national park centres. Uh, we produced a couple of um, free Dark Skies pocket guides. We're now on the second edition of those. Um, and at our national park centres, we introduced telescope hire um, for the public, which um, is really popular, um, and also introduced us a small amount of merchandise in terms of um, astronomy and stargazing charts and stargazing material. As Joe mentioned, um, we recently produced the Astronomer's Guide to Exmoor National Park Dark Sky Reserve. Um, really pleased to say that's now available as a free download. The reason why we produced that, it, it became clear I've been attending um, over the last few years the Southwest Astronomy Show um, down at the Norman Lockyer Observatory in, in Sidmouth. Um, and it became clear by talking to actual amateur astronomers, they wanted to know a little bit more than what we were previously offering them. They wanted to know where were the, the really best places to stop and set up their valuable telescopes and equipment. Um, and they wanted to know which might be the best businesses to go and stay with who might understand their needs. So from that, we um, started developing um, a few things um, in addition. So the, the guide was helpful for them. We also saw them as another audience for our Dark Skies Festival, which has been running now for, um, in, it's now into its fifth year. Um, so in addition to events throughout the year, we perhaps have um, some camp outs with, with our national park rangers. We also have um, talks on things like glow worms and bats at night. Um, the festival over the last few years has really provided a key focal point for um, some of our activities and has really aided our promotion. During the festival, we aim um, our events at various audiences. The largest one definitely is the family audience. There's, you know, adults and children with next to no or, or very little knowledge of astronomy. And what we try and do is inspire them to want to know more, to want to understand why the skies are so important here. Um, and the benefits of having a dark sky and keeping our light pollution minimal. So we have talks from people like Joe at, at events at Wimbledon Lake. Um, but in addition to that, we have just events that are outdoors where people can enjoy the experience of Exmoor at night. For children, sometimes just being out at night on holiday is the most fantastic experience and the excitement of them is quite palpable. For those, those who are more adventurous, there's, people, you know, there's things like mountain biking at night. We've had running events at night. So um, in addition to the other things that we put on for astronomers, which might be um, talks by um, some quite eminent astronomers. Last year, we had some talks by Professor Roger Davis, who's a cosmologist with Oxford University. Um, people with a bit more in-depth knowledge can come to talks um, by people like Professor Davies, and they can also um, enjoy things like astro astrophotography workshops um, to inspire them to come here. Um, and experience our dark skies for themselves. The other thing that we realised is that people who um, who hear about our dark skies, they, they contact us and say, you know, where, where do I need to go? When can I come? Where can I stay? Um, and although, yes, it's very easy to say, well, you could stay anywhere on Exmoor and really enjoy the dark skies, it's nice to be able to, to push them towards certain um, people who have a passion for dark skies and will help them to get the most from their visit. So in the last couple of years, we've been developing a programme called our Dark Sky Friendly Accredited Business Scheme. Um, and I'm pleased to say that we have about 20 businesses who are now accredited. Um, they all appear on our website. Um, but those businesses, basically, they generally are accommodation providers, but they've had training um, by Joe um, and from ourselves in learning more about the night sky and learning more about how to help people spot basic constellations, to talk about the movement of some of the planets and to talk about the issues surrounding light pollution. So as someone who's perhaps, you know, their interest has been sparked in Exmoor's dark skies, it's a really good place for them to go and stay. In addition to the knowledge that those business owners now have, um, a lot of them also have now have equipment that can be available to loan. They might have um, just basic equipment, like it might be a, a ground sheet or blankets. It might be a, a flask available that they can go and make themselves some hot chocolate so they can sit out or lie out on the grass in the dark, um, look up and really experience um, what it's like to look up at thousands and thousands of stars. 
Um, some of them have gone a step further and some of them have binoculars and uh, telescopes that you can also borrow. So those 20 businesses um, are really doing their best to push out the message for us. Um, and as such, we hope are benefiting from receiving star beers and enthusiasts. Some of the, uh, uh, a couple of businesses there, and in particular, there's a business called Wild About Exmoor, who are based at Exford. Now, um, pictured in the middle there is Jenny Wild. Her and her husband have been running Dark Skies experiences on Exmoor for several years now, and have really gained valuable experience and knowledge in running events, um, both static with telescopes and talking about what they can see in the night sky, um, but also taking people on walks at, at night um, and they've been really well received. We're um, pleased to have um, just recently um, put them and Exford Bridge Tea Rooms together. Um, they've formed a collaboration which we now call the Dark Sky Discovery Hub. It's a place where people can go to the tea rooms, they can find out more about stargazing in the area, they can see star charts of what's on in the night sky at the minute, they can also find out about events um, and starting on the 1st of June, um, Jenny and the Exford Bridge Tea Rooms are um, joining together and giving weekly presentations and stargazing evenings with a bit of a meal thrown in um, so that our visitors can enjoy the stargazing experience and learn about our dark skies all year round. So we're really pleased that's literally just come together in the last couple of months. Later on this year, we'll also um, be adding another dark sky discovery hub, which will be at Wimbledon Lake. Um, where again there will be events happening all year round, which will be really key towards our dark sky and astro tourism office offer. The, uh, the last thing I want to mention that we're working on at the minute and we're going to be um, promoting later this summer is a dark sky discovery trail. Again, when I mention about the focal points that we need, so when people are thinking, where can I go, what do I do then? Um, we wanted to develop a walk which people could do safely at night that we promoted as in a walk to be done at night. Um, and this walk um, is only it's only about a mile or so long um, out on the open moor. But what's special about it is that it has 360 degree um, views of the sky. So on a clear night, um, you really will be anyone will be completely blown away by the experience they have there. It can be something that they can do themselves. There'll be it'll be a self-guided experience. But in order to promote it, we will also have a, um, a sort of flyer and a downloadable information to help them do it safely um, and confidently. Um, and we will also be having a short film. And that's why we're not promoting it just yet, because we want to capture some footage this summer um, of the Milky Way that you heard Joe talking about, which we will use in our promotion of the Dark Sky Discovery Trail. So. Um, as I said, we've got things now developing all year round for people to come and do. Um, there's loads of resources here. We've got businesses who are trained in helping people make the most of our dark skies. Um, and as such, that's all really positive news, we think, for tourism in the area. All of the information um, that I've talked about in terms of the businesses and uh, the opportunities for stargazing, uh, the, the guide from Joe, they're all available on our stargazing web page, which is there. Um, just as a backdrop for this uh, web page, I've got one of Keith's photographs there, the sort of thing that we use to help promote Exmoor and our stargazing um, offer. So I hopefully um, that will make sense. And if there's no, not too many technical problems, uh, Keith will be talking to you next. Katrina, thanks ever so much. That was really interesting. So much going on, on the, in, uh, within the National Park and um, we're really lucky to have you pushing it forward like that. Thank you very much. Um, our final speaker, Keith Truman, is a photographer who's produced some absolutely stunning images of Exmoor, particularly of the night sky. And you may have seen the spring newsletter from Society uh, this year, and that included a lot of Keith's fantastic photographs. Um, Keith's having some problems with his uh, connection, but hopefully um, we can go over to him now. Over to you, Keith. Keith, we still can't hear you.
Well, I'm awfully sorry, but we can't hear Keith at all. Um, so there's something going wrong with his connection. Um, which is a great pity. Um, I'm, yeah, there's no sound coming through at all. I'm just wondering, Nigel, if um, if uh, Anne can unmute him. Um, yes, can you do that, Anne? He, he isn't muted. No. Thank you. <laughs> Keith, can, I don't think you can hear us, but there's no sound at all. Um, I'm not sure what we can do. With sign language, I think we've uh, we, we might have to call a halt to, to Keith. Um, perhaps we can go into the questions session, if we may. Um, if the rest of the panel are free, um, we've had a few questions. I'm just seeing if this one come in here. Well, there are no open questions at the moment. I've got one or two here myself, actually. Um, uh, Joe, you talked about the, the Starlink um, issue. Are any sort of mitigations in place, um, you know, to look into that or to, to reduce the effect of it? Um, it's a very good question. And um, sorry, it's, I say it's a very good question. And uh, yes, there are. Um, but there's a great reluctance in the scientific community to sort of um, to, to, to sort of rile uh, Elon Musk because as I say he is such a driver he's got is such a visionary in space exploration so there are various different organizations including the Royal Astronomical Society across the world who are holding meetings with SpaceX to try and solve the issue one one part of, of perhaps being able to solve the issue is to actually cover the satellites with some non-reflective coating um, so that obviously it doesn't reflect the sunlight. But yeah, um, you know, it, it is in discussion because, as I say, it's not just amateur astronomers that will be affected potentially. It's it's proper scientific investigations as well. So, yeah, there are discussions uh, taking place. So hopefully something will come from that. Thank you. That's helpful to know. Um, another question here is, um, since the pandemic started, has, um, do you think young people, this is to you, Katrina, as well, do you think young people have become more interested in the night sky because they have more time on their hands? You know, we've become more interested in nature, certainly. And I've had more time to go out in the garden at night and just stare upwards. On the night, it's not raining, of course. Um, I just wonder if it's generated a bit of interest. I, I, I personally think it has, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think at one point during uh, the height of the first lockdown, uh, various different telescope uh, retailers had completely sold out of telescopes. And so they were quite hard to get hold of. Um, and like you say, Nigel, um, the night sky is, is, is particularly inspiring at the best of times, but when you've got time on your hands, it's, it's even better. And also the lack of pollution as well in the air made um, some of the nighttime observations, you know, absolutely phenomenal. So definitely in terms of astronomy, yes, it has. Interesting one. Yeah, one thing I noticed actually was the the lack of vapor trails from the aircraft. And suddenly, because we're coming out of lockdown a bit now, the sky is full again. Um, yeah, absolutely. And the vapor vapor trails, particularly, um, you know, when when they're around, this what well, something that astronomers use is something called the seeing. So when you have no vapor trails and you haven't got the light, uh, the pollution from cars and and, and so forth, um, you know, your seeing is so vastly improved. Um, and, and you're able to see with much more clarity, um, you know, the, the stars and, and the planets and so forth. Yeah, um, to, perhaps to both uh, you and Katrina, for some people going out on the moor in the middle of the night might be a bit scary. Um, 
Can you give them some reassurance that it's quite safe? You're not going to meet the Exmoor beast. I can't speak in terms of the as a beast. Um, I mean, all I can say is that obviously we know that Exmoor is a, it, you know, pleasingly a very safe place to be anyway. Um, I think there are precautions that you can take in terms of just making sure that people know where you're going and know that you're going out, um, taking uh, your mobile phone with you and uh, and just being aware of what's happening around you. Uh, I mean, things like the Dark Sky Discovery Trail, that's, you know, we will give some guidance within that about the precautions that you need to take and what you need to be thinking about. Um, one, one question, in fact, I saw raised um, recently, which is relevant here, there was mention about, oh, is everyone going to be running around with torches? Um, because obviously torchlight is, as well is light pollution. Um, but in terms of uh, what we're talking about and Joe's been talking about with stargazing um, and astronomy, then the sort of torchlight that we recommend is red torchlight, um, which is far less impactive on the eyes and also on um, wildlife. So it shouldn't be a problem. But also the other thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that, is that if you spend time out, outside at night, in the pitch black without street lights, then actually after about 20 minutes or so, your eyes become accustomed to the dark and you can actually see your way and feel your way quite quite safely, um, much more so than you might realize. And, and Joe, who spends far more time out on Exmoor and wherever in the middle of the night than me can probably about. I, I, I can actually, and I can also give a little bit of a tip with, with the red torch. There is actually no need to go out and buy a special uh, devoted red astronomy torch. All you need to do is eat a piece of baby bell cheese and use the little red wrapper that's on that. Cover your ordinary white light torch with that little wrapper, secure it with an elastic band, and there you have an astronomy torch. So there's no need to go out and specifically buy one. You can easily make one. So yeah, it's, it's very useful. Absolutely. Excellent tip, particularly if you like cheese. <laughs> um, just a, a final one for me, really. Um, I'm keen on photography, but I'm not particularly good at night photography. That's why I was hoping to hear from Keith. Um, but are there the special times of year when you would suggest going out to do photography? I mean, I took the shot of the moon in broad daylight um, because, I thought, as you were saying earlier, I think it, it does glow too much at night. Um, so would you recommend particular times to go out? Um, in terms of sort of planetary and lunar photography, um, sort of any time of the year is, is OK. Obviously, as Katrina said earlier, I would suggest autumn time because obviously the, the nights draw in uh, quicker um, and it's not quite as cold. Um, you don't particularly need, if you're only doing lunar photography or planetary photography, um, you don't need any specialist um, uh, cameras. You know, even a mobile phone would, would be fine to take a picture of, of certainly the moon. Um, so I would suggest autumn time when the nights start to draw in a little bit um, is a really good time of year to, to start thinking about perhaps doing astrophotography. If you're a more serious astrophotographer, um, I would suggest that you start with a very basic telescope um, um, with perhaps your mobile phone and if you want to progress on from that then you know looking at, at specialist cameras like CCD cameras but certainly you know uh, lunar and lo uh, lunar uh, photography and planetary photography is is where to start uh, and it's relatively you know certainly with lunar it's relatively simple um, but as you say Nigel not a full moon because because it would just give you too much sort of, it will be over overexposed, uh, it's too bright. So, you know, half moon, crescent moon, fantastic object to look at. Brilliant, thank you, Joe. Um, we've got another question come in uh, for Katrina. It's from uh, Keith Howe, actually, a colleague, uh, a fellow trustee. Uh, Keith says, um, you're doing a great job, Katrina, promoting dark sky activities on Exmoor, but is there not potentially a conflict between commercial gains and a loss of Exmoor's special qualities because so many people begin to disturb the nighttime environment for wildlife and tranquility. Um, no, I think absolutely not. I think the thing is with, with stargazing um, is that it is really low impact on the environment. Um, I think what even, even, even with what we're trying to do and what we're aspiring to achieve in, in terms of our astrotourism off, offer, um, we're not suddenly going to become invaded by thousands of astronomers and people going out and spending every night um, you know out on the moor and, and um, interfering with wildlife 
um, the numbers are still going to be, you know, relatively, you know, tiny compared to the, the impact that the, our visitor economy has during the day. Um, so I don't think, you know, we don't see it as a threat to our um, dark skies and our nocturnal wildlife. I think it's just really important that what we are trying to achieve is to get people to actually really appreciate them because, it, you know, in the same way as, as with um, nature and with wildlife, if people don't have a, a love of it and don't have an understanding of it, they're not going to help protect it. Um, and in the same way, if people don't go out and experience what uh, an unpolluted night sky can look like, they're not going to realise the detriment that light pollution has. Thanks, Katrina. Yeah, that's a very good point, I think. Um, there was one other question. It's not really related to today, but a previous session, and I can probably answer this one. Uh, it's from Lisa Eden, another trustee, actually, who says that um, she saw a small bat flying in broad daylight in Horner Wood yesterday. Is this unusual? Um, I can answer that because my wife is a bat ecologist, and I hope I get the right answer. But yes, yeah, sometimes bats will come out in the daytime. Um, very often, particularly at the early part of the year, when they're coming out of hibernation and they're desperate for food to build up the reserves, which they would have been depleted over the winter months. And so they will sometimes emerge in daylight to, to feed. This is particularly true of Dobenton's bats. You will sometimes see them over the river uh, trying to feed. So it's not unusual, uh, particularly unusual. Uh, last year, actually, first part of the lockdown in the summer, we actually had um, a Barbastel bat, a very rare one, flying around our garden. And it ended up sort of up under the tiles of our shed, which was that was unusual to see such a rare bat. But anyway, thanks for that question. Um, I think that's probably the end of the, the question sessions. There aren't any more. So what I'm going to do is hand over to Rachel Thomas, the chair of the society, to um, draw up the concluding remarks. Rachel. Thank you, Nigel. And a particular thought of the lack of being able to get the photographer to speak. Uh, but I just want to draw some conclusions from the overall um, aspects of the webinar and the actual importance of dark skies from all the speakers. <clears throat> and I think the biggest point overall is that by concentrating on nocturnal Exmoor, the significance of darkness to wildlife and people has been revealed. In the last hundred years, the scale of change from moonlight to electricity today has led to 24 hour daylight experienced in many places. And it's easy to forget what this means for species who move and forage at night and how they've had to adapt or have not survived. And at the same time, there's been the impact on people losing the ability to use moonlight darkness or complete darkness, seeing stars and experience experiencing very much the vastness of the universe. Even Exmoor declared a dark skies reserve in 2011 because of low levels of light still suffers in places from light pollution. And certainly things can be done to reduce that. These overall live webinars have brought together biologists, ecologists, farmers, writers, artists, filmmakers, astronomers, astronomers and tourism providers, all showing how much we should value the darkness. In the first webinar, Professor Fiona Matthews from Sussex University and chair of the Mammal Society gave some alarming statistics of how light, in her words, messes up the biological and ecological functions of two thirds of mammals who forage and feed at night. She demonstrated the worldwide scientific research taking place into light pollution and its impact on wildlife and how different kinds of electric light can have damaging effects on a range of species, giving examples of moths and bats in particular. Two Exmoor case studies, one dealing with the 16 out of 17 breeding bat species found on Exmoor and illustrated with stunning photographs by Dr. Elizabeth Bradshaw. And the other case study was a description of the National Trust Riverlands project, reinstating beavers and given by 
Jack Sidder, who illustrated his talk with nature writer Tim D in a second webinar gave a detailed description of night's migration undertaken by many birds with a fascinating account of three birds, the red start, the pied fly catcher and the wood warbler who fly to and from our Western oak woods such as Horner twice over the Sahara overwintering in South Africa. They fly by night because of it being cooler with fewer predators, have no sleep for the 72 hours and use their inbuilt map, compass, clock and calendar. The case study was, was given by young Exmoor farmer, Hal Holly Purdy, who spoke movingly of the peace experienced at night after a very busy active day, particularly when carving and lambing took place. And she went on to say how this can lead to deeper reflections. The third webinar showed how the arts can provide different insights into the importance of night to both wildlife and Giles Quam, a historian and architect, explored how electricity has blurred night and day and the effect on living, on particularly rural living, starting in the 19th century with the use of tallow candles in both larger houses and cottages. He touched on how rural life has been idealized and ignoring the plight of the rural poor. Even in the 1960s, some tenants on Exmoor still had earth closets outside, but he finished on a positive note, the English cottage was still alive and well. Exmoor author Victoria Eva described how she often wrote at night because there were few distractions and therefore could be totally absorbed in the story, releasing her imagination. Internationally acclaimed artist Susan Durgis explained how nature can come to life through direct photographic printmaking and gave examples of her beautiful prints, for example, a hawthorn branch of a hawthorn at a full moon. And of course, this last webinar has looked in detail at the night sky with astronomer Joe describing how our ancestors experienced very little light pollution and only dark skies. And she gave some very good examples of how this pollution has gradually built up and particularly around cities. And followed by Katrina Monroe from the Exmoor National Park Authority on how this particular importance of night skies was such an asset for Exmoor and its importance particularly to astro-tourism and the Exmoor economy. Hopefully we had hoped Keith Truman would provide useful tips about night photography. But finally, the Exmoor Society has experimented with these live webinars and realizes how different they are from conferences, being more intimate and less formal, appearing in some places as a fireside chat and drawing in the unseen part participants to further understanding. There have been several mistakes with the technology. I was hoping to say only the loss of one speaker, but now have to add two. But even so, we have had pleasing feedback from participants on how much they have enjoyed and learned from them. We will be using live webinars in future to reach new audiences with speakers from around the world, but also we hope to return to the conference format as well next year. So I want to just leave you with a few headlines from a professor, pull the curtains, turn off the lights. From a young farmer, we are part of nature, not separate. From an astronomer, Exmoor is a fantastic gem for stargazing and contemplating the universe. And finally, from a nature writer, three special birds, not weighing more than 10 grams and with the brain size of a pea, fly to South Africa and back to Horner Woods 
Exmoor, crossing the Sahara twice every year. And on that note, thank you all for listening and hope that many of you will now be able to go on and listen more in detail uh, by going onto our website and hearing the webinars. Uh, and please excusing some of the gaps and mistakes that have been made. But thank you and goodbye.